In 2015, residents from a small town in southwest England called Weston started to notice something strange happening in their area. Some kind of construction was happening at a disused outdoor swimming pool. Outside of this site, there were signs that simply said Grey Fox Productions. The residents were told that this was the name of a movie that was being filmed there, but it wasn't long before people started to have their suspicions. Things were not adding up, and images of the construction site started to leak that showed us a different picture. The site had a strange castle, a ferris wheel, and sculptures that seemingly had nothing to do with a movie that was supposed to be a crime thriller. Thriller. On top of this, a certain somebody was constantly seen around the area that raised even more questions. This person was Holly Cushing, a woman who is widely considered to be the manager of the prolific street artist known only by his pseudonym, Banksy. At this stage, people were still unclear as to what was happening, but all of their questions were answered on the 21st of August 2015, when the doors to the site were finally opened and the residents were greeted with a harrowing sight. Dismaland an art project that is one of the most ambitious exhibitions Banksy has ever made. Described as a bemusement park, Dismaland is an entire world of its own, filled with disturbing and unnerving art pieces from 58 different artists and 10 original works from Banksy himself. Over the course of 36 days, thousands upon thousands of spectators visited the park to see pieces that were filled with social commentary, political satire, and harsh truths. This is one of the most complete, complex, and nuanced pieces I have ever discussed, so today I'm going to be taking you on a tour of Dismaland so you can get an idea of how eerie, strange, and groundbreaking this theme park truly was. In these videos, I try to start with a bit of background on the artist in question, but in this case, it's obviously quite difficult given how much anonymity surrounds Banksy's name. All you really need to know is this. Banksy was most likely born in the mid-70s a few miles away from Bristol. Simon Hattonstone, a prolific journalist and interviewer for The Guardian, is actually one of the few people to meet Banksy in person. This was in 2003, so the info is 20 years old, but it still gives us a good idea of Banksy's age, what he looks like and where he came from. In that same interview, Banksy said that he was a teenager who constantly got into trouble, he was expelled from school, and even spent a short amount of time in prison for various different crimes. His escape from this was art, which he started to pursue at 14 years of age. He was a member of a well-known group around Bristol called Dry Bread's Crew or simply DBZ, but he was also working on his own material during this time and eventually became a solo artist. He was heavily inspired by different artists artists around Bristol who were part of the underground scene. One of his biggest influences was another artist by the name of 3D, otherwise known as Robert Del Naya, who was also the founding member of the hugely successful trip-hop group known as Massive Attack. There have been many theories that actually suggest that Robert Del Naya is Banksy. However, there are some inconsistencies that poke holes in this theory. At the very least, they are said to be friends, and it's possible that they have worked together on a number of occasions. Regardless, it wasn't his identity entity that made him famous, it was his art, and one of his breakout pieces was a mural called Mild Mild West, a piece that criticized the riot police around Bristol and the rest of the country. It quickly caught the eyes of the public, journalists, and various different news outlets. It most likely opened a lot of doors for Banksy, who became a household name in the 2000s. From here, there are a lot of creations that I could talk about, as Banksy traveled around the world creating murals and exhibitions that were widely publicized and discussed all over the globe. Here are a few pieces that we'll quickly cover to give you more context to Banksy's work. In 2003, Banksy created the piece Love is in the Air, otherwise known as Flower Thrower. It has become one of his most well-known creations, and the most popularized version of this is a mural that was painted in Bethlehem, Palestine. It shows us a man with his face covered in an aggressive pose, throwing a bouquet of flowers. It's actually quite similar to the Mild Mild West mural we discussed earlier, and this is because this kind of imagery is consistent in Banksy's work. He not only utilizes flowers, but many other things that could be perceived as colorful, innocent, or even childlike. Using this kind of imagery to cover subjects like war, poverty, and discrimination was incredibly effective, and when people saw a Banksy piece like this one, it was difficult not to stop and think for a second. Speaking of, arguably Banksy's most popular piece ever made is a good example of how he mixes innocence with darkness. 
Girl with Balloon was created in 2002, but it wasn't an official mural until 2004, when this version of the piece was found on the Waterloo Bridge in London. Soon after this, other murals popped up in Shoreditch, Israel, and various different parts of the world. There was also limited edition prints that were made, and in general, it was distributed on a much wider scale than his other work, which may have been the reason it became one of the most popular Banksy creations of all time. It could also be the simplicity of the piece. It simply shows us a girl with her hand extended, reaching out for a heart-shaped balloon that is being taken away by the wind. It's simple but effective, and it's not surprising that it became so well-known. In recent years, the piece gained massive publicity because of an auction that happened in 2018. An adaptation of the original piece, created by Banksy himself and given to a friend in 2006, was sold for around £1 million. Within a few seconds of this happening, the painting essentially self-destructed. It was released from the bottom of the canvas and it shredded half of the painting. According to Banksy himself, he designed this painting to self-destruct the second it was sold, and it was actually supposed to shred the entire thing, but it simply stopped halfway. This actually created a new piece in its own right, which was titled Love is in the Bin, and this painting sold for 18 and a half million pounds, making it the most expensive piece that Banksy has ever made. It has been quoted as the first artwork in history to have been created during a live auction. We've talked about Banksy's first piece, his formative work, and his most popular piece, but it's time to start talking about the subject of the video, and what I think is the most ambitious exhibition he has ever made. It all starts with a series of paintings made by a man named Jeff Gillette. In 2010, Gillette created a very popular solo exhibition called Disneyland, which was a series of paintings that showed Disneyland in a post-apocalyptic setting. I highly recommend looking into these paintings yourself in your own time as they are both brilliant and haunting. For obvious reasons, these paintings caught the eyes of many people, and one of these people was Banksy who reached out to Gillette in 2015 to purchase one of his creations and to let him in on a well-kept secret. Banksy was working on something that was more than likely inspired by Gillette's work called Dismaland. But instead of a series of paintings, he would use his resources and his money to literally create a theme park in the middle of the UK that would bring this dystopian imagery to life. He asked Gillette to be a part of the exhibition, who quickly said yes. 57 more artists would create pieces for the exhibition to bring Dismaland to life. And on the 21st of August of that same year, the doors opened. What you are first greeted with when you enter Dismaland is a harrowing sight, a grey building with no life to it whatsoever. When you walk into this building, you will be greeted by a security screening room with employees that are not happy to see you. People are stopped, searched, and asked intrusive personal questions. Immediately, the energy is unwelcoming and tense. When you get through the screening process, you will be met with an overwhelming sight. An array of strange-looking sculptures and various different employees scattered around the park that look void of any emotion. These employees are all holding up black balloons that contain a depressing and self-deprecating message. I am an imbecile. Not a single person who is working at the park looks happy to be there, and this will be a reoccurring trend. Dismaland is vast and confusing, and like I said, there are dozens of art installations and exhibitions to look at, but here are some of the most interesting pieces. One of the first things you'll notice is an installation called the Big Rig Jig, a looming structure that towers over the park. It was created by Mike Ross in 2007, and since then, it has traveled all over the world. It was at Burning Man, it was featured here, and now it's permanently located in Las Vegas. I found an explanation of this piece that delves deeper into the structure's potential meaning on the Atlas Obscura. It says the following, Big Rig Jig utilized two decommissioned trucks, referencing a global oil industry at the nexus of our world's political, social, and environmental systems. By repurposing these symbolically rich objects, the artist conveys his admiration for and anxiety over humanity's power. However, Mike Ross, the actual creator of the piece, said the following, It's just cool to see trucks in the air. That is also a fair explanation. Regardless of the reasoning behind it, the Big Rig Jig is a great piece to loom over Dismaland. It's rustic, slightly eerie, and it fits perfectly in with the rest of the installations. Maybe it doesn't have a deeper meaning, but in the context of Dismaland, it finds a whole new meaning, and that is also a reoccurring trend in this park. 
If you look to the right of the big rig jig, you will find an installation called Pocket Money Loans by an artist known as Darren Cullen. It was a place where kids could get an advance on their pocket money for a mere 5,000% interest. It also has a trampoline installed inside the actual exhibit so that the kids who visited there could jump on it to see the small print and the top of the building. This was right next to the children's play area, which was also a desolate looking sand pit that featured nothing but broken, run down objects that the kids could could quote unquote play with, although they wouldn't get much out of them if they tried. Finally, for the kids, Dismaland had a merry-go-round that was filled with horses that genuinely looked happy to be there. They were all painted in different colors and even had names written on them, giving them their own unique personalities. Unfortunately for these horses, in the middle of the merry-go-round, a lone butcher sits on a box titled Lasagna. Behind him is a horse that met a grisly fate, and it appears that these horses are not just here to be ridden. This was a pretty direct reference to an actual scandal that happened in the UK and different parts of Europe two years prior in 2013, where actual horse DNA was found in frozen burgers, lasagnas, and various different pork products, causing a huge recall across various different stores. This installation does a great job of satirizing that, but it's also quite creepy, giving the horses names and different colors only to reveal the true intention behind what they're doing is effective and unnerving to say the least. The interesting thing about all of these installations I just mentioned is the fact that Dismaland was actually visited by families, so many children did attend this park, which led to photographs of unenthused children in the area who were genuinely let down by the experience. It's funny in some ways, but it also shows you how effective Dismaland truly was at being a bemusement park. It really did live up to the name in many ways. Not every piece was made with kids in mind, and some of the exhibits were a bit more mature than others, such as the refugee boat that floats eerily near these exhibitions, a piece that was actually made by Banksy himself and fittingly called Dreamboat. Another sculpture that was also made by Banksy shows us an orca jumping out of a toilet into a hoop that it clearly cannot fit through. This is widely thought to be commentary of the abuse that orcas faced in SeaWorld, which was heavily exposed in the documentary Blackfish. These orcas were caught at an early age and taught tricks to entertain SeaWorld spectators, but the extreme stress that this caused ultimately led to aggression. An orca named Tilikum killed three people while it was held captive, and this piece seems to be a critique of the needless stress that these animals are put through for people's entertainment. This is also notable because it's the second exhibition that reflects on how major corporations treat animals. There are so many pieces I didn't get to talk about, but to give you a full view of the park, we can take a quick trip on the Ferris wheel. This footage was taken by YouTuber Brady Stuff, and when you see the park from these heights, you can truly start to see the rustic feel that it has, and just how damp, gloomy, and grey Dismaland truly is. Banksy and the featured artists really managed to create an aesthetic that was perfect for the park. One of the biggest structures you might have noticed from the Ferris wheel is this sort of castle at the end of the plot that almost looks looks like it's about to fall apart at any second. This castle and what's inside it are considered to be the centerpiece of the park and the last place you're supposed to visit. It's another Banksy original and it was certainly the most talked about piece by the media. YouTuber Theme Park Collective took a tour of Dismaland and entered the castle, so I'll show you a clip of what's inside the building and then I'll explain the significance behind it. dark and it's dismal in there and there's straight lighting. Stand there for a photo. Get this degree. You'll have to come back. The glasses go This way ends joy. So that might have been a little bit jarring, but this is what was inside of the castle. 
As you can see, it is a pretty grisly interpretation of Cinderella. She appears to have crashed her carriage and is presumably dead. Around her, there are mannequin photographers with motorcycle helmets who take flashing pictures at such a quick pace that they almost look like strobe lights. That is why it's difficult to even make out what's happening in the video or the room in general. This is commentary on the death of Princess Diana, who died in 1997 in a tunnel in Paris, when her driver, Henry Paul, lost control of the vehicle and crashed into a nearby pillar. Paul had been drinking at the time, which played a factor into the crash, but multiple different photographers on motorcycles were taking flash photos of the vehicle, and there are a few images that show us the distress that this was causing for the driver. This is the final ever photo that shows Princess Diana alive, and we can see that Henry Paul is yelling and Diana has turned her head away from the photographer. Another chilling detail about Banksy's piece is that after Diana passed away, the photographers continued to take photos. Although some of them tried to help, most of them didn't, and this means that there were quite a few photos of the actual crash itself. In some of these images, Diana's hair can be seen dangling from her car, which is very similar to what we see with Cinderella in her carriage. It is an unnerving detail that makes this already creepy exhibition even more haunting, and it's one of the darkest pieces in the entire park. This being the last thing you see before leaving Dismaland must have been a harrowing feeling, and I can imagine it leaving a lasting impression for years. That is close to a dozen pieces featured in the park, and to be honest, I wish I could go into more detail, but Dismaland was so dense that it was almost overwhelming to research. Like I said, there were almost 60 different artists that created art for the overall piece, and I do highly recommend looking into them yourself. I will leave some links below that will serve as a jumping off point for exploring the entirety of the park. Dismaland closed on the 27th of September 2015. The 150,000 spectators that visited the park during this time were met with exhibitions that were guaranteed to have a lasting impression of them, and although I wasn't there in person, it had the same effect on me too. It's definitely one of the most ambitious projects I have ever talked about, and I highly recommend exploring the park yourself. Thank you.